Well, we are very pleased to have uh, MT here giving us a seminar. So um, I'm never sure how to introduce MT, but I would say he has done a lot of work somewhere in between approximate inference and optimization. And um, um, yeah, and um, I had the chance to work a bit with him recently, which was great. And um, right now he's going to talk to us about Bayesian principles for machine learning. And uh, maybe I didn't say that MT is at Riken Institute, I should mention, but I hand the microphone to you. All right. Great, thanks a lot. And thanks for the invitation. And I'm happy to uh, see some of you here. Um, yeah, so I will, so I did actually visit um, Second mind, which used to be something somewhat different before, uh, a few years ago, and I did give a talk, part of uh, which I might be repeating some things, but there are some new things that uh, have, you know, come up and new ways of explanation. So hopefully, it will not be too redundant. Um, I probably have more material than what I can cover, but we'll see how much we're able to get to. So the summary is uh, Bayesian principles for, for learning machines. Um, and let me just start with the, the big picture that many machine learning people like me are interested in. Uh, it's about designing artificial intelligence systems that can learn like humans and animals and other living beings. And when I say uh, learning like humans, what I mean is that AI systems that are able to quickly adapt uh, to new situations and learn new skills um, and do this throughout their lives again and again, just like uh, we do. And you might have seen these videos. Uh, if you have seen my talks before, it's my daughter trying to figure out uh, you know, what this thing in front of her is about and then slowly kind of collecting data about the world and realizing that the music is the most interesting part. And after some trial and error for uh, many months, she kind of figures out what she likes and dislikes in the world and what she wants to see more often. Um, so she has sort of learned a new skill. And then if you give her more time, she can, she's gonna use this skill to go into a different instrument. So this is guitar. And she has sort of used her past experience to learn something uh, new about the world and uh, understanding more about herself, what she likes and dislikes. So this is the property of human learning that's uh, really amazing, that's kind of missing right now in, uh, in machines. And so this kind of um, failure cases, you will often see that if you change the setting slightly, uh, you know, move the uh, stage just one inch uh, from where it used to be, the, the robot could catastrophically fail. And this is just not, uh, you know, um, uh, acceptable, uh, as we, we all agree to that. So, yeah, I mean, uh, people uh, uh, do talk about that we want, this is a big question, that we want machines that can learn as efficiently as humans and animals. And they talk about having a new learning paradigm to be able to do this. So the, the kind of work that we're doing is really about coming up with this new learning paradigm, which is based on Bayesian principles. So we use Bayesian principles to, to do this. This slide summarizes everything that I've said, is that what we do right now is more on the right side. It's more bulk learning, all the information at one place, everything is stationary. I know what I want to learn. Then I just kind of run things for a really long time. Uh, spend like a million dollars, and then I get something that, that works quite well. But humans are doing something very different. We are doing something for our, uh, you know, throughout our lives, having these interactions from day to day, and we don't really have control over what we see all the time. Sometimes we can choose it, but it's really, really correlated, slowly moving thing. And sometimes there are jumps, some changes. So the world is very non-stationary, but still we are able to somehow adapt and continue to 
uh, to gain more experience about the world. So we really are looking into um, reducing this gap. And of course, we look at Bayesian principles because um, the, lots of this learning on the human side and the biological learning, a lot of it can be explained using uh, Bayesian principles. And the work that we do in our group is to try to bring this same idea to a wide variety of machines. So very different kind of learning machines that exist in, uh, uh, in you know, statistics, in machine learning, in optimization, in other fields, uh, they all seem to have something in common and which is what we are kind of uh, showing. So, so you could call it deep learning with Bayesian principle, but it's kind of like, you know, general, gen general learning uh, machines using the same set of principles that are based on this Bayesian uh, flavor, Bayesian philosophy. And then to, because we can combine these things and see everything with the same lens, we can sort of unify, generalize and improve existing things. And that's the point of uh, the work that uh, we've been doing in the past. So the key idea that you will see uh, that repeats again and again, it's all about then approximating the posterior and uh, not really doing the exact posterior, but trying to build approximations that will dig more and more information. And they, has to, they have to be somehow constructed in a way that if you increase the complexity of approximation, you get better algorithms. So this is the work that I did. I mean, it was first done in like 2017. It took some time to uh, convince myself and also other people in the community but now we have a paper on this uh, where we call, um, you know, this is a new uh, rule. It's like an extension of Bayes rule. So it's Bayesian learning rule, uh, specifically for learning algorithms that is able to kind of have this property where if I change the approximations form, I get, uh, you know, better and better algorithm. So I'll try to uh, tell you a little bit about that, how we can derive deep learning algorithms from it and many other learning algorithms as well. But uh, then we can, because we know the connection between Bayesian algorithms and deep learning algorithms and other things, we can now borrow strengths from there uh, and make something better. So I will very quickly show an example on uncertainty uh, estimation in deep learning. I'm not sure if I'll have more time, but let's hope for hope that we'll have more time left after this. But this is the new thing that we are working on. We uh, are now using what uh, uh, we get from Bayesian learning rule. There is a dual perspective to it, um, which kind of helps us to go to this ultimate goal that we have, bring, uh, designing AI systems that can learn throughout, uh, you know, that can learn like human throughout their life. So I will maybe very briefly talk about this, try to give you a sense of what we are doing now and what we're going to do in the next few years. The impact here is that we are trying to bring many seemingly different things to at the same platform and seeing everything with the same lens. So that's the point. Okay, so the, the paper is this one. So the first part of the talk on Bayesian learning rule, uh, you can find this on archive now. It took me two years. So when I came in 2019 to visit, uh, I said that this will be ready at some point, And then it took me two years almost to, to finish this. So now it's here. Okay, so let me start. Let's start with what we know, right? So in deep learning, we use this principle of trial and error, and it's sort of based on this frequentist philosophy of empirical risk minimization, maximum likelihood principle. So we have a loss, we have some data, we have some model parameters to minimize the loss or so something like a regression, have some regularizer maybe there, and then use some kind of you know um, gradient-based method to optimize it. Um, and this works quite well. Right? We, we know that this is kind of uh, everybody's fascinated with right now. But it, many times it seems like black magic. We don't know why things work well. And there's a lot of like uh, uh, trick of the trade involved here. And if you move away from this framework even slightly, uh, then you have to work very hard to make things work. And this is 
kind of the motivation for us to start asking something fundamental about this process that, uh, so uh, this is written in the section six, which is in the end. So usually people don't see it, but this is this has been the motivation for us is that, uh, well, if you want to, uh, you know, if you get some data, uh, I hope you can see my cursor here, but if you get some new data, we have to kind of, uh, revise our beliefs as we get new data. And a good learning algorithm should sort of be able to separate the noise from the real information, but we don't know what real information is. And a good algorithm should have kind of this property. And if you think that they're the good algorithm, maybe they are optimal in some sense, they should sort of uh, be, you know, these many different flavors of good algorithms should all be derived from a common origin. There should be some common origin, it's likely that it exists. Uh, so if there is a common origin, then these algorithms should optimize very similar objective. And the way that the optimization proceed should also be kind of similar. Maybe you have to do tweaking depending on some particular settings, but the principle of it should be the same. So this is where we start uh, thinking about it. And we argue for these Bayesian ideas, which has kind of two steps to it. So let me first go to the, the, the Bayesian uh, argument. Uh, of course, you could write uh, this uh, minimization. Instead of doing this minimization, you could do something Bayesian. And usually we write that with uh, Bayesian inference. So we write that as an integral where we marginalize out things. Uh, but there is a slightly more general and alternate formulation that many of us call variational inference. Uh, but I call this Bayesian principle because this is slightly more general and we can talk about this, why I think that calling it variational inference is a bad idea. But uh, the objective sort of looks like this. It's, an, uh, it's basically what you would call elbow. We're using a posterior approximation. So you're optimizing over certain set of uh, probability distribution. I'm going to call it generalized posterior because this loss may not be a lot probability. So this could be any black box function. You could plug that in there. So instead of minimizing and doing a point estimate, we want to find a distribution. And it's sort of motivated by this maximum entropy principle. And also, this was originally uh, proposed by Zellner in optimal information processing. Are you able to see my mouse, by the way? Could you? Okay, yes. good. All right, great. So that's good. Uh, so it's kind of like, you know, you maximize the entropy. So the entropy should go like the distribution should be very wide, but then you get the data and the distribution will sort of be at the optimal place where it should shrink. And that will, that is the kind of uh, uh, the way it's written. But uh, the way to think about this, because you know, Bayesians get very depressed by saying that we are doing approximation, it's not exact posterior, so I must be doing something wrong. Uh, but I want to kind of convince you that doing uh, you know, any kind of Gaussian approximation that you do is actually as good as what people are doing in deep learning. It's not worse. So we shouldn't be kind of looking down on ourselves that much. The important point here is that we, don't want to optimize the original loss, rather we want to optimize something different. So it's a modified loss. So it's kind of a smooth loss. Um, and just to show how it's kind of smooth, so I show here this example of Gaussian approximation. So uh, this is taken from uh, Ferenc's uh, blog, a very nice visualization that he did. So x-axis is the mean, y-axis is the standard deviation, and I'm basically plotting this expectation of the loss. So there's no entropy for now. Uh, this bottom one is the whole thing. And the top one is just the expected loss. So you could see uh, the expected loss as we um, uh, you know, increase the standard deviation, the loss becomes smoother because I'm sort of averaging at several places. And somehow the minima that uh, is more deeper, it remains, so it has, it is expect, expected that this type of loss will have slightly better property because it's kind of more stable and uh, probably go to 
flatter minima more often. This kind of idea is now taking off in uh, you know, deep learning theory. There's a very nice paper on this implicit regularization uh, that instead of optimizing this loss, when we do SGD or some other stochastic training, you're actually optimizing something else where you're adding this regularizer. And um, although I don't have time to write this down, but if you read this paper and you look, look at our Bayesian learning rule paper, you will see that the regularizer has some similarity there because it uses the Hessian and the gradient. Anyway, I hope somebody will work on this and, and show that it is indeed Bayesian, uh, but we don't have time to do this right now. So, so this objective, so our first uh, argument is that we should be used doing this instead of that. And you could see why that might be better. Um, so then we propose a two-step procedure to, to do this optimization on this side. Uh, the first step is to choose an approximation, of course. And uh, we, uh, in the paper, we restrict to mixture of exponential family uh, distribution. Uh, these are quite large uh, class of distribution. So it includes like, of course, Gaussian and Bernoulli and all of these standard exponential family but it also includes like Laplace distribution and finite mixture of Gaussian and other things. There's a huge list in the paper uh, that I will encourage you to check out. Uh, some notation that we need right now for step one is that, uh, well, exponential family, if you don't know the, the details here, don't have to worry about that. Just think of Gaussian, that'll be enough for the talk. Uh, that you take this Gaussian form, it's a quadratic, and you write it in slightly different, like theta and theta, theta transpose. And then you look at the things that are in front and you sort of call that to be this lambda. So this natural parameter is this precision matrix times the mean and the precision matrix divided by two and the negative sign here. The other parameterization that will be useful uh, for the next part is an expectation parameter which is basically like moment parameters, so it's expectation of theta and expectation of theta, theta transpose, which is the mean and the moment matrix. Um, I just summarized this whole thing here and you really don't need to uh, remember the exact form, just know that lambda is the natural parameter, mu is something like an expectation parameter, so more like mean. Um, so this is the first step, you choose an approximation and you, are, uh, you can choose any approximation that you want in that family, uh, depending on what sufficient statistics you think is appropriate for your data. And then the step two is that you try to find the, the parameter of that distribution. So, so far it's pretty much looking like variational inference, but then it deviates here slightly that it uses this particular optimization algorithm, which we call Bayesian learning rule. It's natural gradient variational inference, if you wanna call that. Uh, but I want to go, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to call it variational inference because it's strictly more general and it's more about principle here. So, because it, it does, it applies beyond probabilistic models uh, for any general loss, any general problem. So, um, okay, so we're going to use this algorithm and the quantity that we're taking the gradient with respect to is not lambda, rather it's the expectation parameter. And this is why this is natural gradient variational inference. Not gonna go into the detail of why this it is like that, but you can look into uh, the paper in this particular section. So when I started doing this many years ago, uh, I got a lot of backlash. Uh, by the way, if you have any question, you can stop me at any time. But it's taken me many years to convince people that this is the good idea to do because why not just use Lambda here? That's the question that people have been asking me for many, many years. And what I uh, try to say to people is that this is a fundamental property of Bayesian objective, that natural gradient here is not a choice, that I'm not coming with, you know, inventing some fancy algorithm because I like to do fancy math, but rather if you actually go inside and you look at the fixed point of this algorithm, well, it does involve this, these gradients with respect to mu, well, you don't have to take gradients with respect to mu, but actually if you sort of look into um, the simplicity of the natural gradient, it has this kind of dual form that lambda is the natural parameter which uh, sits in one space, 
and mu sits in the dual space. So it's sort of derived from something we call Legend transform or functional duality that is fundamental to Bayesian objective. It's because of this entropy term that exists there. So if you did this on usual objective, like just loss of theta, this will be zero. You won't have this lambda here. So Bayesian objective is very specific in this case that you have this entropy here and the entropy sort of sits, you know, the derivative sits in the primal space, in the lambda natural parameter space, and these gradients sit in the dual space. So this view is extremely important. And if you understand this, if you kind of think a little bit more in terms of like exact Bayes rule, you will see that the exponential that's being used in Bayes rule, it also ar uh, arises because of the Legendre transform. Okay, so Fenchel dual of entropy is an exponential in the you know, um, exact case, but that thing also generalizes when I do approximation. So it's a very fundamental thing that natural gradients are sitting here and they're being assigned to natural parameter and we shouldn't ignore this. What this algorithm is doing is that it's essentially trying to minimize the gap between these two things because you know Q star and lambda star, they're connected. You may not have closed form expression. So you do a gradient update, but you take the gradient in the dual space and you update the parameter differences in the primal space. So it is extremely important that this form is used. So this is all kind of argued in this paper in detail. Uh, and I hope that you will not just, you know, uh, reject this work because it's just natural gradient variational inference, but there's a lot more to it. Um, okay, so the part that actually becomes quite interesting is this uh, thing about information matching. So if you look at this equation, here you see that natural parameters are assigned uh, some natural gradients, right? Uh, now, what happens actually, what we'll see, um, but I don't know if I'll have a time to uh, talk in detail, but essentially if you read the paper, what you will see is that uh, natural gradients, depending on what approximation you use, they start to kind of ask, uh, you know, important information about the uh, loss. So for example, if I choose this to be a Gaussian with, uh, with um, an unknown mean, then somehow this will, turn into the gradient of the actual loss. It'll be something that will be derived from that. If I increase the complexity of the Gaussian distribution to include the covariance matrix as well, and I want to estimate that as well, then you will have a second equation. Uh, so this natural gradient will have now two parts. And the second one will be asking questions about second derivative. They'll then be assigned to the second natural parameter, which will be the precision matrix. Okay, so this point is extremely important that as I increase the complexity of the, uh, of the posterior approximation, I start to get more and more detailed information about the loss. So, um, uh, and then those detailed information and they're ass assigned to natural parameter. So this is the key thing behind and the paper is kind of all about this. This message is again and again shown through throughout the paper for many different algorithms uh, that I can change Q. And then I, depending on the algorithm, I can start to do some tweaking to how I compute the natural gradient. I can do a slightly different method to compute it. And that will allow us to choose the type of information that we want from the lost landscape. If we just want point estimate out of it, we don't have to go and look into second order information. But if you want to get like something like a second order optimizer, then we have to do a slightly more complex thing. Then I can increase, you know, I could use a multivariate Gaussian, then I can, I can increase the complexity of it by using a mixture of it. And I'll get a more complicated, you know, information about the lost landscape. I, so yeah, so just to say this again, that there is a, there is a connection between the complexity of the posterior approximation and complexity of the learning algorithms. And I can sort of go from very simple, so Gaussian with fixed mean, I get gradient descent. 
Gaussian with unknown mean and covariance, I get Newton's method, then do mixture of Gaussian and uh, you get a mixture of Newton, a multimodal algorithm that will go to um, you know, try to uh, find multiple solutions. And if you continue like this and keep inclu including more and more information in your posterior, uh, you will approach the exact posterior in the end. And Bayesian learning rule will, that uh, derivative that I take, it will become exponential operator and I will recover Bayes rule from it. Okay. So, Maybe I'll just finish this and then I'll stop for some questions because I know I've given a lot of information. It's a little bit too much to handle and there might be, you might uh, not agree with all of this and we should have a little bit of discussion, but let me just very quickly go through this process for a very trivial example, which is gradient descent. So try to derive this from Bayesian learning rule. Uh, you can choose, you can fix the covariance to be constant. So it doesn't matter what you choose really. You could choose it to be any fixed matrix and that only affects the step size. This is all written in the paper. So you write the natural parameter, you write the expectation parameter. Entropy is constant in this case. So when you take Bayesian learning rule, the derivative of entropy goes away and the expectation parameter is just the mean. Uh, natural parameter is just the mean. So it's very, very simple. And you, you get something that looks almost like this, but now you have something because of Bayes you're doing a smoothing over this Gaussian, a fixed width, but you you can do you can ignore that information because you. So this is where the natural gradient approximation comes in, because you want to compute and uh, get an algorithm that's greedy that only looks at one point in in the last function. You want to do an approximation that's in statistics is called delta method. So you only look at loss at that thing and with this trivial thing, you get back to uh, the gradient descent. If you did the same thing with Newton's method, you, you know, that's where it's kind of more interesting, but I won't go through the math. It's just, it's just doing more, you know, manipulations. So there's nothing interesting there, but this table sort of summarizes uh, what happens there. So I've only talked to you about uh, gradient descent so far with fixed covariance and the approximation that I use is delta method. So you can see that there are two parts that you have to decide. One is posterior approximation. The other one is specific approximation to how do you compute this gradient, how you approximate it. And then you can sort of go Gaussian with unknown covariance, do the same thing. You'll get Newton's method. You do mixture of Gaussian, then you'll get multimodal optimization. This is a new algorithm that we uh, come up with. Then you could do the same thing with deep learning algorithm. And it's sort of uh, adding stochastic approximation not using the Hessian, using you know some square root scaling, uh, which is a weird thing that um, people haven't understood yet why that works. Uh, we spend a lot of time in our work to then not do square root scaling and then try to uh, use a Hess better Hessian approximation. And what we find, so we call this online Gauss-Newton and variational online Gauss-Newton, where we remove the delta method. So we do something like more Bayesian. And this gives us very good uncertainty um, estimates in the variance. So of course, when you're not interested in uncertainty, then this is fine. But if you want to compute the variances right, then you should be doing uh, a better Hessian approximation. There's a theorem in the paper. So you could read these papers for details. In, in the reference one, this theorem one, that shows why this has Hessian approximation is bad and this is better. So you could show it theoretically why that will give you a bad result. There are other results, new ones on like doing dropout and doing uh, this uh, binary neural network uh, where your weights are binary. And when you compute the gradient, the gradients don't make sense because the weights are binary. Why would gradient make sense? So now we show that if you write the expectation outside, well, uh, now you're estimating this, uh, parameters of a Bernoulli distribution. So that makes uh, sense. It's a continuous uh, quantity. And then the Bayesian learning rule gives you an algorithm that uh, Benjo and his uh, group has proposed something called, um, uh, I forgot what exactly it is. Uh, I, I forgot what STE, but then we try to add Bayes 
to it to estimate uncertainty, do continuous learning with it. So we've done all sorts of this kind of thing. It also goes to other things. There's a, you know, all of this message passing stuff. This is where I started working on. And if you're a Bayesian, I would really uh, ask you to check out this section 5.4, which has a lot of new things. Okay. So I will skip this. Um, you might have seen this many places. So this is that result on this Gauss-Newton improvement of Adam by relaxing some of this Hessian approximation. This is on toy data. You see that it kind of does the same thing, but on, in, on ImageNet, uh, it works quite well. It gives us, uh, so this, this result is on the large scale, ImageNet scale, and the algorithm performs very similarly to Adam. We're not using square root here. Still, it works. Uh, it's a slightly more tricky to work because of this variational thing, because we are sampling things. So that adds a little bit of uh, more uh, work there to, to make it to work. Uh, but sorry, I'm gonna skip the details, but you, 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 can, you can get decent results from it. And I have worked with many people in industry and academia now uh, with where they've tried to use some of these things and they're able to reproduce what we did. So I have more trust on this. Uh, one thing that is usually missed when you start to use this algorithm, there is a paragraph in the paper that really goes into detail of how to take Adam and then turn into, you know, a Bayesian uh, version to get estimate, and uh, um, the variance estimates from it. The trick is to mimic Adam as closely as possible. And there are certain parts to it. So you start doing with this online Gauss-Newton first, to do something like Laplace approximation, and then you add the randomization on top. So you keep all the hyperparameters to be the same as Adam. Then you do a slight change of removing the square root and make it a Gauss-Newton method. And then you add, uh, once that works, then you add um, uh, uh, you know, sampling to it and you kind of do some scheduling so that sampling doesn't ruin Adam's trajectory in the beginning. So you do something like a cold posterior in the beginning. We were doing cold posterior even before they were using that term. So you start with a very cold posterior and then you kind of warm it up slowly to bring that tempering parameter to one. So this is what kind of makes it to work. It takes a little bit of more work, but then because of this connection to other, um, you know, posterior approximation, you can go from simpler posterior approximation to more complicated ones. So you could do like mixture approximation or you could do a Laplace approximation, sorry, Laplace distribution, like a sparse uh, scale mixture of Gaussian approximation. Uh, you could do all of those things once you get this to work. So that is the benefit. And that's where I think this is uh, going to be useful. So the details are all in my NeurIPS tutorial. Uh, we have since then done a lot of work on it. Uh, and Wu Lin is uh, our PhD student who's been working on this. Uh, over the years, he's been doing this. His papers are not particularly easy to read, so uh, people miss these things, but I will really encourage you to uh, look into uh, his papers. His most recent one is perhaps, it's probably not easy to read, it's, but it's really incredible work that really generalizes all of these Bayesian learning rules stuff that we are doing to a very general uh, case where you can use curved exponential family. So you, you don't read this minimality constraint. Uh, minimality constraint is required because Fisher matrix is not invertible. So we have lots of you know, uh, reference to the work that was done in Prowler with uh, uh, Hugh Salambani and, and James Hensman. So we, th there's a lot of discussion there and I'll encourage you to read that. Uh, essentially, in summary, we show that you, whatever Gaussian approximation you do, you always get Newton's method, but there are always variants of Newton. It's different kinds of Newton method you get, so all, all sorts of uh, family of Newton method that you can derive by changing the posterior approximation. And that's what is interesting about that work. So this is the old thing. All the collaborators are in here and some new stuff done with uh, Paul, who uh, you may know. And uh, yeah, okay, so I will. So I'll stop here.
take some questions. And if we have time, I'll go through the dual perspective. I can start uh, with a comment and then a, a question. Uh, uh, no, I like how your how your message has uh, clarified from the <laughs> previous iteration, and uh, I like the uh, unification where you revisit uh, existing algorithm from the principle. Uh, if I'm the devil's advocate, I, I would say that I feel even in the simplest uh, gradient descent. You need to do this uh, global to local uh, extra small approximation to get the match. And uh, my my uh, feeling when I've read a lot of your your work is the message is often uh, a bit hidden or cluttered by the the fact that you always need some extra uh, small bits of trick. And so my question would be. Uh, what would be uh, what would you recommend uh, to that we look at? What's your cleanest, like from principle to an existing algorithm, or from principle to a new and uh, efficient algorithm? And maybe uh, could you go into well, uh, detail about one of these? <laughs> sorry if it's a naughty question. But. Yeah, S sorry. I I will strongly disagree with the fact that I've I've heard this question many times, and I I don't believe in this. So. When you say you I have I have to do this local to global approximation, I have to because I'm deriving non-Bayesian algorithm. Okay, so uh, it's about like choosing what you want from the Bayesian posterior. If you only want the mean, I don't have to you know look beyond it. So if you're doing SGD or Adam or Newton's method, any kind of optimization algorithm, you're only interested in the point estimate. So you have to do uh, the delta method. But if you go to, you know, other things like, I mean, you, I think the most fancy thing that I did that I already did in 2017, that I will <laughs> again ask you to look at it because it's, uh, it's, the, it's perhaps the most important thing. So the second part of my talk is really about uh, looking into this view. So the non-conjugate variational inference where when you look at these natural gradients, uh, you see that they actually turn into messages in a graphical model. Uh, and this is very counterintuitive. You would not expect the computation that is done in the dual space to come out to be message, for example, in Kalman filter. It's the exact message that you will use in this edge, you know, this when you pass through the graphical model. It's very neat. Uh, so actually, uh, for me, you don't you you didn't need any convincing in 2017, but you know here we are, five years later. It's just hard stuff to uh, you know wrap your head around, which I understand, but uh, it's all there. Oh, I, I'll check this one then as my next iteration. <laughs> I have one question too on the uh, like general principle of uh, of learning you you presented. The even if we are not supposed to look at uh, at the quantity as an elbow, like you you made this point, but you still see this as an approximation of something that you would like to compute but cannot compute, or not. No, maybe I'm missing a missed a part in the question. So which? Uh, um... Sorry, when you when you presented the. Um, the elbow earlier and variational inference, and you were saying you don't want us to look at it as an elbow or as variational inference because oh, okay. it's more general than, than that. But you still see this as an approximation to, uh, to a quantity, which is the evidence, but you don't have access to the evidence, so you do what we can afford to do? Yes, I, I hope I understood your question, but I'll just say a few sentences and then you can correct me. So, sure. yeah, the, the, the way that, so I, when I was saying that I see this as a more general principle, meaning that it's not inferenced in a probabilistic model. So this loss could be kind of arbitrary and I'm trying to approximate the Gibbs free energy or something like that. So people call it like generalized posterior. Uh, that's the word that they use. And what I'm saying is that then of course, when this is log likelihood, then it's Bayesian inference, and um, it's uh, 
is fine for you to do Bayesian stuff. Um, and that's where I would call it variational inference. But this is more of a principle uh, in the sense that I'm, uh, if, if you call maximum entropy principle, if you start with that, <laughs> Uh, you are maximizing the ent entropy and you have these terms that come from the loss as constraints to you. So you are sort of, when you choose your posterior approximation, suppose you choose it to be a Gaussian with unknown mean only, then this will be a first order kind of constraint. But when you add mean and variance both, then it's, it's a second order constraint because you've added, uh, you know, for every uh, data point that you see, you're trying to now uh, also match the mean and the variance both. Does that make sense? So you can increase this. You can increase the moments. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, that, uh, that, that, that makes sense. And maybe an, uh, an, another quick question is, you, you never said the word uh, probabilistic numerics. Is it, do you want on purpose <laughs> to avoid saying it? Or is it just a given that this is probabilistic numerics? Okay, let me say it loud because I'm gonna I'm gonna visit Philip on Tuesday. Pro I think it's a setup. I think he has invited me for this particular reason. But this is not probabilistic numerics. Okay, so yeah, so the diff. Sorry, I mean I'm not an expert on probabilistic numerics, and I uh, the way that I've I've uh, understood it is that there you start with an algorithm that is doing something maybe deterministic, and then you add probabilistic information on top of it. So it's more like a bottom-up approach where uncertainty comes as a side thing. Here, it's, it's a more of a top to down approach. So you start with the posterior and you choose what you want to, what approximation you want to do there. Depending on what you do, this comes out as a special case. So, I really believe that, of course, you know, if you look at it first, you may say they're both doing the same thing, but the philosophy is very, very different. And that leads to very different kind of, uh, you know, new algorithms that you would do. So that is my opinion. Okay, thanks. All right. So I've used 40 minutes. I. Uh, how much time do you think we can take more? Uh, I mean, we can do uh, an hour okay. in total. So, oh, okay, let's see how much I can. I'm not uh, prepared to uh, do the talk quickly, the next one, but uh, please interrupt me and ask me questions. So if you... Uh, if this is going too fast, and then I can just kind of cover parts of it instead of going through it. So, I mean, maybe this is also related to this probabilistic numeric stuff that we just said. I believe that the way that we are looking at the problem, uh, starting from the approximation and then looking at the uh, posterior, this Q of theta, as a representation of the knowledge. So whatever knowledge is kind of um, you know, is there in the loss function. When you do this optimization, it's, it's, this information is assigned to lambda. So it actually goes to Q. So the Q contains all of this knowledge. It contains first order derivatives, maybe, maybe second order derivatives when it's uh, more complex. And, and you could, you could uh, go in that way. So whenever you have this type of... Uh, uh, you know, first order and second order uh, information, you can always look into the dual of it. For example, if you have a matrix, you can always kind of look at the, um, uh, so like think of like the Hessian of a least square uh, uh, problem. You can look at the dual of it, which is a Gaussian process problem um, because it sits in the function space. So that is kind of what this is trying to bring, that uh, it now starts with this idea that when you run this algorithm, you already compute this dual representation. And now we can exploit this dual uh, representation to do transfer, like knowledge transfer, like knowledge representation, knowledge transfer, um, uh, some sort of like thing that you need for adaptation and continuum learning. 
So that's what this part is all about. So we've been working on this for now maybe two, two and a half uh, years now. And it is not completely clear how, uh, you know, these papers that when we wrote them, I didn't have the Bayesian learning rule paper, so I couldn't really always point to it. Uh, so now I'm in process of communicating this idea to you that all of these things are actually byproduct of this same Bayesian learning rule. So, um, okay, so that, that would be my hope to communicate. The first part, memorable experience, I will talk about how you can take this sort of uh, fixed point of this Bayesian objective, and then you try to kind of perturb it to understand what data points are important, okay? So I, I, I think many of you probably seen this in my new tutorial, if you have seen that. Uh, I asked this question, well, I have this classifier here for two classes. And if I ask you a question, which data points are more important? Um, of course, my, almost everybody chooses the red circle because it's close to the decision boundary. And if you uh, remove or add these points, um, then the classifier just gets disturbed the most, right? So in that sense, they're important. So what we can actually do is that we can grab this importance of the data point from this dual perspective that we get from these algorithms. So you, the model looks like this. It has no idea. If you only look at theta, it has no idea uh, what data points are important, but you can actually go to the dual side um, in this function space. And if you look at this data view or the dual view, then you, you, you will see that these things are more uh, important here. So uh, this is what we've been, uh, I mean, we worked on this in 2019 and now we're writing a long paper that takes two years again, but it will be out uh, sometime soon on this. Uh, but the basic paper is actually already out. So this one that did all the kind of hard work, but it's very hard for, again, to follow why we are doing these things that are doing. And many people say that you could do all of this with just first start approximation. And I say that that's not correct, but uh, we will we'll get to it eventually. At some point, people will uh, appreciate this. But the essential idea is the the that you take this kind of loss function, whenever you do a Gaussian approximation to the loss function, that gives you sort of a uh, you know, quadratic approximation to this loss. So it's a Gaussian approximation. So it's, it's the thing that I did in 2017, converting non-conjugate problems into conjugate problem. And this conjugate problem is just a quadratic. So now I'm looking at the, uh, the, the, the dual, meaning that I could see these losses as constraints to the problem. Um, so if you see it as constrained, then you can uh, recognize that these things that I'm getting in the um, you know, front, by the way, this, all of these y tilde, phi, the sigma i, they are obtained from this natural gradient. So the details are in this paper, but essentially you take the natural gradient of each data point, you can get these individual site parameter, if you may want to call, call it, because uh, this word is probably more popular in your company. So essentially this parameter here, it uh, looks pretty much like Lagrange multiplier. So I hope you see my point that the Lagrange multiplier tells you which constraint is the most important. And this is a concept that's being used in optimization for ages. Uh, and that's essentially what we get now by solving a Bayesian problem. So we didn't start with an optimization problem. We started with a Bayesian problem. And now we can actually, uh, you know, have first order, second order, and different kind of information, not just, you know, um, doing a simple Taylor approximation to it. So it's, it's quite powerful in, in that sense. I'm not gonna go into the detail of that, but if you look at this sigma i square that's obtained from there, we call that, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of relevance or the dual variable. And we use this to define memorable example. And um, it's, um, it's, so this new thing that, uh, so some big announcements gonna come in, in a few days. 
so I'm going to reveal why we are doing all of these things. But uh, right now, it's just a footnote here that we call this base duality uh, because of this dual relationship. Uh, but this helps us to then look into uh, the, the dual view, helps us to understand uh, what uh, happens to these fixed points. If you kind of remove some examples from there, then it gets disturbed the most. And those examples are kind of the weird ones. So these are most memorable examples. If you look at them, they're, they're, they may be some of them are mislabeled example. So uh, maybe, uh, I, okay, I'm not able to find, maybe this one is mislabeled and mislabeled. Uh, and some others are sort of very, you know, these are called high leverage points. So if you remove them, then the decision boundary gets affected the most. Um, so it's a mix of those points. While the least memorable ones are very far from the decision boundary, you remove them, not much happens to the optimality condition. And that is the kind of idea. So this is generalizing this idea that already uh, exists in uh, statistics for diagnostic uh, measures. But, uh, um, but this is strictly more general. I can't prove it to hear, you here. And the paper is not out, but uh, hopefully you will read this in a month or two. So same thing on CIFAR. These things are all regular shapes and sizes, and these are not, okay? So we, we did this thing, and this was the kind of first thing we, uh, we've done uh, with du duality. And actually, we proposed it at first to do continuous learning uh, using Bayesian principles. It's, sort of, it's done with many people uh, from UK and some interns um, from EPFL and other places in, in Europe. Uh, and it's published in this paper. So this part is published and you can check that uh, paper. Uh, I hope you know what continuous learning is. Let me not go through this, but it's about not forgetting the past. Uh, and essentially you, you, know, you have some old data and then maybe you get some new data and now you wanna get as close as possible to this. And what people do is people use this weight regularization from the past data. So they'll take this data They'll use this line, build a Gaussian approximation, do a quadratic regularizer, but it doesn't have access to the exact data like this, uh, the, the old data. So it doesn't do very well. So even in the, on this toy data example, you can break it very, very easily. Uh, yeah, it's because like it's paying attention. So this is old data and this is the new data. Oh, sorry, this is the old data and this is the new data and it's trying to separate the new data very well. So this class and this class should be separated. And that's why the line is drawn here, but the optimal line is actually here. So it gets it wrong in this case. So uh, essentially it's kind of showing you to, that if you're looking into theta space and you're doing this regularization, it's kind of not uh, very powerful because it's only looking at the parameter and the parameter uh, may not be the right thing to do. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look into these memorable past from the old set. So this is the old data set here. And I'm gonna pick some few points here and I'm gonna try to regularize them. And essentially the way that we originally derived it is that we said the KL in the elbow, we are gonna approximate it by a KL in the function space. And of course, this is not equal. So that was a little bit problematic and we didn't like it, but we still tried it to see if it works or not. And you get this kind of regularizer. So this KL is different from that KL, KL in the theta space, because here you get differences between the function values at these points. XM is the memorable past. So you're trying to make sure that the predictions are the same in the function space. So we sort of knew that this has the right property and it works quite well. The results are in this paper. I don't have time to go through that. But I, we were not really satisfied with that. So we wanted to prove that maybe this has some kind of optimality property or you know, why does it work so well as well at, as it does. And we looked at this and it turns out that this dual representation in the function space, it has the right form to reconstruct the gradient of this past data examples. So you don't have to store all the data example, you could just store some, but somehow it's re mimicking the gradient of the past. So you call this now uh, K prior, and this is in this paper. 
And in the next two minutes, I'll just quickly go through this, not go through the details of this. But essentially, the idea is that, oh, well, wait prior is doing wrong because it doesn't know what the past data is. The past data is here and here, okay? So I'm just gonna add some part, some representation of that past data. So in this case, I just added four points. And I don't, I, I put them a square because I don't need the label information for them. I just need the prediction of this old network, okay? And if you do that, then it fixes the issue. Okay. So it kind of looks surprising. The way that we do this is that we look into the divergences and I can't, so I have to write another paper on this, why this is same as the Bayesian principle that I told you in the first part, um, but it comes from this optimality condition. And um, so let's not go into that, but essentially what we're doing in this paper is that we are comparing the function output from the past. So this is like the past data, but I'm only looking at the four locations and I'm comparing the, the, the prediction of the old model and the new model that I'm trying to find and trying to match them somehow on the old data. And I add this uh, K prior as the regularization to the new loss. And we have proof that you don't need the label actually, you just need the prediction. If you just predict well in these four points and regularize the weights using same kind of weight regularizer that you had, adding this actually corrects the gradients. This is what actually Fromp was doing, this first method that I showed, that it was comparing these function values. And it was weighing because we had only few points. So there's more into that and I could, explain to you in a uh, in more question answer session but uh, essentially you know it, this is on a 2d example just showing you know, on this toy example that if you add one example here you already start to get the gradients to be kind of very similar so black is the uh, exact and red is the approximation here and now you can sort of do this you can increase the number of points and you will see that the gradient becomes like almost the same and the optimum is kind of moving towards the exact thing. So uh, of course, you know, you, there is some error, but you, you, you see that the, this optimizer, uh, this min optimum with the approximate problem is already at a very good place. The gradients are almost zero, this whole thing. So with a very few data points, you're able to sort of represent the past knowledge through this memorable past and regularize those things. Uh, and actually, I mean, believe it, believe it or not, all of these things are come up with Bayesian principles and this idea of dual perspective of the Bayesian learning group. So, okay, so that is that is it. I There's some results in the paper to show that you need very few data points. Um, and if you actually just use the, those data points with labels, you do really badly. So actually not using the label is better and it has connection to knowledge distillation uh, and there's a lot of these connections with svm knowledge distillation that are discussed so this is a new kind of like looking at again many learning machines from very different uh, fields and putting them all together using this bayesian principle is what's going on here so i'm not going to go into this model selection thing but i will i will stop here um uh we're, showing the picture of the group and some of these people you may know. Okay, so I'm done at eight. Great, uh, thank you very much. Uh, what time is it? We have time for, for, for some questions. Anyone has question in the rooms or in their room? <laughs> Well, I have more of a comment, perhaps, like the last bit. It's perhaps a high level explanation, like going, going back to human intelligence and trying to mimic what, how human uh, intelligence works. Um, uh, it might be a high level explanation for uh, uh, like distinction that we have in cognitive sciences between episodic memory, semantic memory. Uh, the reason why we, we still we keep exact memories of uh, events uh, you simply need them to kind of distinguish between to avoid catastrophic forgetting. Um, exactly. Yeah. Just yeah. No, I think 
Yeah, I think this is what gets me kind of interested in this is to, you know, I mean, of course, we are writing this at the data level right now. So this dual that we write, it seems, you know, it's defined at the final layer at the bottom. But, you know, if you think in terms of duality, then anywhere, like in a way you can think if you have a graphical model, uh, the edges are kind of sitting in the dual space, you know? Uh, so like the layers, the, the, the constraint that you have that this layer output should match the input of this layer, that's a constraint. So you can define dual variables for, for those as well. So you can have with this kind of, the dual is just trying to understand how the models are connected to each other. And when you remove an edge or remove these connections, how things change. So that's why they, these are kind of fundamental to adaptation. So when I say memorable experiences, and right now I'm just showing data, but what I actually mean that you have a big model, you have parts of this model, think of it as like, like a watch. You have a watch and the watch has parts in it. And if you wanna find out what part is the most important part of the watch, you will try to go there and inter do an intervention. So you do like you'd stop that part and see if the clock stops working, you know? So duality is central to this, this question. It's not going away here. So all of this memory stuff that we talk about, I believe that there is a connection to perturbation. Um, and uh, we have to think about representation learning. Um, we don't know if we need to store exact data we need to store like, you know, what those data uh, evoke in the model and those parts of the model that has to be stored. There's a lot of very interesting question that we can tackle with this thing. So I completely agree with you uh, that representation is the thing. We don't know <laughs> how to, you know, which thing is important to store and we'll have to figure that out eventually. But on that matter, actually, it's in interesting that a lot of models in uh, cognitive sciences about uh, human memory. They, a lot of them involve uh, like prototypes or centroids. If, if, you, if you take yes. classification examples, they, they yes. involve prototypes or uh, essentially centroids of clusters of labels, right? Rather than yes. uh, edges uh, of the cluster, which is what you would say that is more important uh, because they're the leverages or supports of yes. like decision boundary, yes. right? Yeah, I mean, you, so again, like, you know, here I, I pointed out data points, but actually what you want to say is that the, the point here, you know, this region is of importance. This region is of importance. And, and I mean, ideally you would say this region is also of importance. And that's what Bayesian principle is trying to capture, you know, because Bayes will say, well, I'm very uncertain about these points but I'm also uncertain here. But it's very difficult to get this from just first order or second order approximation. We need better ways to check perturbation, you know, better intervention to understand when you change the model, what happens. And of course, the, the optimal thing would resemble like Bayesian, you know, perturbation, but that would be impossible to do. So, so, but, but, you know, deep learning works quite well. So I'm sure there is that information somehow uh, in the deep network that we are not able to unravel. And the, all of this dual uh, view is really about that. Okay, thanks. Um, so I have a, another question on the continual learning part. Yes. Um, Maybe it's a technical point, but uh, so when you when you store your memory, it's uh, with this dual variable at the prediction at the Q distribution at the time where you learn this memory, and then when you start to learn extra things uh, with a new batch, uh, your Q distribution is going to change a bit. So, are you going to? Are you? Do you? Do you revisit your me your learned memory to update it again to update the what's the past memory at some point, or do you keep them frozen? Uh, or do you see what? Do you see what I, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, right now we are we are keeping it frozen. So yeah, it's actually I I must say we have just begin to scratch the surface of memorable experience. So it's very very. This is the first thing that 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 uh, you know one would do is what we're doing. So of course we so right now we have like decision task boundaries. So we say this task has this memory. But ideally, you don't need uh, the task boundary. You can always, at every step, kind of rehash the memory, right? So you could do it, but we don't do it yet. Yeah. Yeah, I guess in the example you 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 show, you manage to remember everything perfectly. But I guess as soon as there is going to be a trade-off where you need to forget something, then we... it's yeah, it's a very hard question. So really, I I think this is. This gets me excited because this is something that's kind of testing, <laughs> testing the limits of what I could do. So we, every time we come up with a new solution, always this will come back to bite you, you know, that your past, something that you ignore, it will come back to hurt you. Be, because that's how these, so you have to make some assumption about the system of, and the, the choice of, representation of like these points in the function space, you have to, uh, you know, so if it matches with the assumption, then things will be fine. So for example, if you have a stationary problem, you know, where posterior only concentrates, then you will see that the, the, the importance of the point, points of how you choose them would kind of maybe decrease over time in some sense, right? So you have to do, you don't have to, you always do exploitation. You do a lot of exploration in the beginning, but then you can just kind of do ex exploitation and prune things out. But when in non-stationary problems, when things are changing, sometimes it'll hurt you really badly. And you, you might have to revisit the past, right? So of course we can never solve this problem in its in entirety, but we can have mechanisms where we realize that we don't, you know, something is broken and we need to fix it and what needs to be fixed. And, you know, I forgot how to speak Japanese because I was, well, I don't speak Japanese, but how I forgot whatever I was speaking before because of the pandemic, because I didn't go out. And now I have to kind of go out and like try those words again to remember back because, you know, I haven't used them again. So there is, there are some principles in choosing these things. And I really don't know what they will be, but I do uh, what I really strongly believe that they have to do with duality, they have to do with this perturbation, and they have to do with divergence functions. So this thing is clear to me, but how I will do it, we don't know. <laughs> yeah, cool, thanks. Sorry, I come up a little bit too strong right now because I'm, uh, <laughs> I have worked too long on this. So I might seem overconfident, but uh, it's an opinion, yeah, strong opinion. Um, do we have any last questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of like thinking about the duality concept. At the beginning, we were talking about the duality with the exponential family. And then at the end, it was more like the duality between the weight space and the function space. Do you see them as the yeah. same? You see them as the same duality, or are they just like slightly different? No, no, no. They're they're very different. Yes. Sorry. Oh. Yeah. That, that's mm -hmm. the part I'm always nervous about. Uh, so so yeah, you're right. So yeah. So like this duality is between the parameters of the exponential family, but the other duality is between like the parameter and the function space. And that's more related to the duality that you, they use in optimization. It's not convex duality, by the way. It's not about uh, finding dual objective and then minimizing it. It's more about representation. So it's about looking into this fixed point and then thinking about if I remove parts, uh, um, remove or, or perturb the um, you know, parts of this equation, then what will happen? Uh, to to the, the solution. So Q star will move if I, let's say, take a loss 
function and I change the loss function slightly. So it's about adaptation, right? You can, as you can see, uh, changing the scenarios from what you've learned before. So unfortunately, well, the hope is that maybe end of this year or mid next year, I don't know, somewhere in between there, there'll be a paper that will explain this of why this is a fundamental concept. Um, and only then it will become clear, unfortunately. So I apologize for uh, the confusion. here. Okay. Um, great. Um, I guess we can uh, wrap up then. Uh, there is no more questions. And thanks. Thanks a lot for the talk and the discussion. Shall we have the... <laughs> it's been missing. <laughs> um, I have never, I have not heard that for a long time. <laughs> yeah.